You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Hello, everybody. Good evening. If you found me here, welcome. I wanted to talk a little bit today about propaganda, and I wanted to talk about innocence fraud. And I wanted to talk about these cons being really good, meaning if you've been fooled by one of these documentaries, it's not because you're so dumb or uninformed. It's because they are really, really effective. And one of the things that they do is the way that they use words. The words that they choose are very specific. Something I talked about with Jane from the National Organization of Victims for Juvenile Victims of Juvenile Murderers. So the movement to get rid of life without parole for juveniles will describe convicted juvenile killers as justice-involved youth. They'll always say in the wrongful conviction movement, they were falsely accused, never falsely convicted, because Obviously, if you say you're falsely convicted, you don't want anyone to think, hey, this person had a trial. Maybe the appeals courts have looked this over and affirmed this conviction. Maybe they're guilty. This is a movement that never says guilt. And Amanda Knox was an aspiring writer when she left for Perugia, and she would have been very familiar with language and the power of language. So I wanted to listen to this interview she did in 2014 in February for the University of Washington, their media outlet. So this is journalism students she's talking to. And I wanted us to bring our own common sense to it. And something that's interesting, one of the main things that's propagandized people to believe that this was a crime of one person, that Amanda and Raph were wrongfully convicted, but Rudy Goudet wasn't, is the Amanda Knox documentary on Netflix. And it's very interesting. Mark Randolph, who started Netflix and was the CEO, his paternal great uncle was Edward Bernays, who was the godfather of PR. And he had some interesting things to say about propaganda. He said, we are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. And there's a very interesting documentary. Of course, many people, especially the Bernays family, felt it was too critical of Edward Bernays, called The Century of the Self but it talks about how PR was created and the things that Edward Bernays used. For example, one of the things was he was given cake mixes. When cake mixes became popular, they were hugely unpopular because housewives felt like they were cheating. And Edward Bernays, whose uncle was Sigmund Freud. He said, well, 
the original cake mix was just water and that's it. And he said, change the cake mix instructions and make the housewife add an egg. And that was the difference between cake mixes being a huge failure and a huge success. So it's very interesting. Just obviously, of course, if you're Freudian, the egg, the ovum from the woman, you know, you can get all into it. But it it worked. It was something from her own kitchen into the, the mix and it worked. So let's take a look together at this interview with Amanda Knox and bring our own common sense to this interview. And if we knew nothing about this case, what would we think? If we knew nothing about it, if we knew nothing about it, what would we think? Just using our common sense and really opening our ears and listening. But before we do... Let's just take a quick break. If you are enjoying this episode of my True Crime Report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. Okay, so let's take a look at this together. Thinking, I don't know what, what to think. Um, because when I went back um, to both completely... Let's get to the beginning. Let's go wait right to the beginning. I remember thinking, I don't know what to think. Um, because when I went back um, to my apartment after the house, but like we had the upper floor, so it was our apartment. Mm -hmm. um, and I found the front door open um, and then progressively found other things like um, spots of blood in the bathroom and um, feces in the other bathroom. Um, I, I remember thinking, I don't know what to make of this. Um, no one was home, which was also like a first. Um, I knew that one of my roommates. Um, okay, so she's just described the scene. You come home, the door is wide open. No one's home. It's a bank holiday. So that was, you know, the long holiday. You're the, she knows that the men downstairs, the four men who live downstairs are at home. She knows Laura and, and Philomena are away and it's just herself and Meredith. And you share a bathroom with Meredith and there's blood on blood in the bathroom door wide open I'm just curious if if every if speaking to the women here would you just go and take a, a shower but okay here we go Philomena was at a was at a party the previous night so it was wherever she was and um, my other roommate Laura I didn't know you know who was also at a party with her friends and who you wanted to hang out with Meredith Kircher. All right. But I knew Philomena was out and I, and Laura wasn't now what she's not certain where Laura is or Laura. But she was on business in Rome, but she was on business of Rome. And actually when I called Philomena, she confirmed that to me. Um, and I didn't know where Meredith would be. But granted, she also has a whole bunch of English friends. And so I had seen her the evening before, or the afternoon before, going out to meet them. And so I thought, well, maybe she's out with them, or maybe she's... Yeah, that was the second diss, Amanda Knox. First was Halloween, where you wanted to hang out with Meredith. And then there was the night of November 1st. 
still asleep. Um, I, when I first went in, um, it was very strange to me. Um, and I didn't know what to think because, yes, the front door was open, but everything looked normal. Everything that I saw just in. I mean, that should just be a big red flag <laughs> when people tell you they're no. It was very normal, nothing weird, nothing out of the ordinary. It looked everything looked very normal except for the huge the the half footprint in in blood on the bath mat and the blood on the sink and in the bidet and the open door. Besides, for all that, it was totally normal. Okay. Walking in the front door, going to my bedroom, and going to the bathroom, the various bathrooms, everything looked completely normal. So I did not think there's been a break in. Um, I just thought, okay, well, the door doesn't. So she's telling us what she didn't think. So I didn't think at the time. Can you imagine if someone said to you yesterday, so what so what'd you do last night? Well, I didn't go bowling. I didn't go swimming. And I wasn't thinking about what I was going to do next Thursday. Wouldn't you think that that person <laughs> is thinking about what they're going to do next Thursday? I wasn't thinking anything weird. It was just, it's just, so she has to make it slightly worrisome, but not too worrisome. Worries her a little bit, but not too much. Right. It doesn't work very well, so maybe someone didn't close it all the way. Mm -hmm. And then once I saw the blood in the bathroom, um, I and the and the feces in the toilet, I thought, okay, well, that's really weird. Um, first of all, the blood in the bathroom, like it was. That's really weird because I'm the only one in this house who normally doesn't flush the toilet. That was so many of Meredith's friends testified that that was one of the things that bothered Meredith about Amanda was that she didn't flush the toilet. She also didn't take part in the cleaning. But really, you know, the main source was a, a personality conflict between Amanda and Meredith and an intense rivalry and jealousy. For example, what really PO'd Meredith, one of the things was when Amanda had her sight set on Giacomo, one of the young men downstairs, Amanda told Meredith, oh, I like, I like Giacomo, but I'll let you have him. Like, of course he'd pick me first, but Giacomo really wasn't interested in Amanda. And in fact, after Meredith's murder, he very strongly, along with Meredith's English friends, thought Amanda was acting very strangely and suspected immediately that she could have done it. So that's something interesting to note of the people that knew Amanda at the time. It wasn't a big leap for them to think she was involved. It wasn't a lot. So I didn't, I didn't assume that someone had been murdered. I, um, I assume that either someone kind of hurt themselves or there was menstrual issues um, and, and they hadn't been cleaned up. And so I thought, okay, well, maybe somebody ran out really quickly and is coming back. Um, maybe someone went downstairs into the apartment below. I didn't know. But when I saw the feces in the toilet, it actually creeped me out um, because that was just very unusual. And so I left feeling creeped out. <laughs> Unusual for who? Not for you, but but she didn't flush it, which is also very weird. If she didn't think any, so you can't really have it both ways. If you didn't think anything of it, right, you you would just flush it. Any woman would. But if you thought that there was a crime, of course, you'd want to save it, right? And Many people noticed that Amanda Knox was very interested in showing the police when they finally came. And that's a whole nother story that I think I've talked about in other episodes. They did not call the police. The postal police came. So Meredith was 
left locked in her room, her cell phones taken. One of her cell phones was Philomena's cell phone. So she had an English phone and an Italian phone. The Italian phone was Philomena's that she had borrowed from Philomena. So the SIM card went to Philomena. That was dumped in a garden backyard of a villa about a little bit more than a half a mile away from the cottage. So when the people who lived in the villa a half of over a half a mile away found this, they called the postal police, gave it to the postal police. The postal police or otherwise known as the plain clothes policemen came by. And when they came by, Amanda and Raph both said that they had already called the police and appeared very nervous, according to the postal policeman's testimony. Um, I locked the door and I left and I went back to Raphael's and I kept brooding over it. He was in the bathroom and, and brooding over it. Um, I had brought a mop from my place because there was water on the floor in the kitchen. His pipe had gone loose. Um, and so I was doing that, I was mopping that up and immediately after he got out of the shower, I was like, tell me if I'm crazy, Raphael. <laughs> like, what, what do I do? Whoa, 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 whoa. So she came all the way back to Raph's to go get him, but she didn't want to interrupt his shower to tell him what she found. She was like, oh, I'll just wait. I'll just do some uncharacteristic mopping of this water. So just to refresh, okay? Because it's so bizarre, the story that she's telling. You could almost sort of zone out and, and stop listening. But the story she's telling is that she took a shower, went back to Raph's with a mop, okay? And that's because the night before when they had, quote unquote, stayed in, right? They had spilled a lot of water make washing the dishes. And because they didn't have a mop, they just put a few thin towels. And now I've said in the past episodes that it was paper towels. I can't remember if they were paper towels or thin towels, but some towels that were inadequate for the amount of water spilled. They just went to bed, slept in according to them till 1030 till she went to her house to get this mop alone. She's just described the scene. She takes a shower, leaves to get Raph. And according to them, they had breakfast for an hour, a nice hour leisurely breakfast. So it's very odd that she doesn't even want to disturb him out of the shower. Like, like, I'll just wait and do some mopping. I just think it's very weird. I've never left a huge pile of water till later when I can get overnight, when I can get a mop. Has anyone else done that? Let me know in the comments if you have. It'd be interesting to hear what those circumstances were. Or if you haven't, just let me know. I'm trying to take an unscientific poll here. Do about this. Um, and he immediately was alarmed and was like, no, you have to call your roommates, figure out what happened. Something happened. Um, and so I, I tried to call Meredith. Her phone didn't answer. I tried to call Philomena. So that's true. She did, she did call Meredith first and all these phone calls were made from Raph's house. And Philomena was very concerned right away and hustled over there with her boyfriend to get back. But Amanda's the only one who saw the scene, especially Meredith's closed door. Lock, and she didn't check if it was locked. It was just closed. And didn't think with the combination of the blood and the open door, didn't think anything, wasn't worried. Everyone was in a panic when they heard that. And so now she's including Roth in that. This is a new addition that he was very concerned. Um, well, actually, I tried to call Laura and her phone didn't answer. Then I called Philomena finally. Um, and, um, and she was very alarmed by it. Um, she said that she hadn't been home that night. She had been out at the party and that I should go and check it out. And so I thought, okay, but I'm gonna go with Raphael. And so we were gathering ourselves and 
we went back to my apartment. So she's only going back because Philomena is, is bossing her around and telling her what to do. She doesn't want to go back on her own. So odd. Apartment. And I was already feeling very creeped out. Um, I was like clutching to Raphael. Um, and we were looking around and we actually opened Philomena's door. And that's when we noticed the, the window was broken. So I immediately thought, oh my God, there's been a break in. And I started running around. I went, I went into the, um, the other bedroom, which was Laura's, mm -hmm. but it was spotless. Like nothing had been touched. Her bedspread was pulled like so wonderfully clean, mm -hmm. um, like a, like a hotel. Like she was a very, she was a clean, clean person, um, which is why it struck me so strongly that in her bathroom of all places there would be feces left in the toilet. I was like, no, Laura's the clean one. <laughs> so, um, so her bedroom was. F Just to recap, she's also already had a shower at Raf's the night before where she goes into detail how he cleaned her ears and dried her hair. So now she's running back to her house to have another shower and then she's got to use the blow dryer in Philomena's room. And it's interesting that she's saying Philomena and Laura were so neat. Uh, I think it's Laura here she's saying was so neat. Because Meredith was also very neat. And that was the... So it seems like she's almost... I don't know. It's, she's just giving a reason why... why how she could tell... How she could tell nothing was missing right before when they called when they finally got around after the postal police left and everyone's telling them to call the police they finally they're pushed to it have to call the real police the carbonari and they and raf told the carbonari nothing was missing and i believe she she informed philomena that nothing was missing but they all had jewelry and it wasn't just computers. They all had valuables. I mean, it's just, how would you know nothing's missing? But she seemed to know a lot of things. She even telling one of Meredith's friends, I know everything at the police station. What do you want to know? I know everything. I, I found her first. What do you want to know? Fine, which struck me as very odd because it's like, if if someone breaks in, like, they're not going to worry about ruffling things up. And indeed, like, Philomena's room was ruffled up. There was clothes and things toppled over and drawers pulled open. And then her room was untouched. The main room, like the kitchen and that area where there was a stereo, there was a TV, untouched. Um, my room, which obviously was not as medicinally clean as Laura's, but un like, as far as I could see, untouched. And, and then there was Meredith's room. Um, her door was locked. Did you guys see that huge swallow she took right before there was Meredith's room? Interesting. And that was strange. Um, she didn't normally lock her door. It had happened at various times, but not, it wasn't the usual thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember even knocking on it, um, thinking, oh, if it's locked, then Meredith must be inside. I mean, why else, why, like, why would she lock the, like, it's not like we were the type of house where you had to worry about people going into each other's rooms. Oh, really? You weren't worried about a, a, a drifter, a serial drifter, whatever they call Rudy Goudet? It's funny because she was the one who told the police when, she, when they came that it was totally normal for Meredith to lock her door. It was the other roommates who said, no, it was totally unusual. Knock that door down. It seemed to the people, are, it seemed if you look in retrospect at it, there's a number of things, and I'm not going to go into them all today, but that made people think that Amanda Knox wanted to delay the finding of Meredith Kircher's body. And one of them was the door. She said, oh, no, that's totally normal for Meredith to lock her door. 
totally normal. Don't worry about it. But here she's in a panic. Like if you close your door, it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember knocking gently and seeing if she would answer and then knocking harder and seeing if she would answer and finally banging on it and being like, Raphael, like, we need to open this door. Like, I don't understand what, if she's not here, like, why would she lock it? And like, I just don't understand. Like, maybe what if something happened like there and you're starting to try to put things together in your mind, like there's there's blood in the in in that bathroom and then there's then there's feces in the toilet. And so like she's still confused. You know, I used to have a teacher who used to say confusion is when you have an answer you don't want. This is not even real confusion. This is fake confusion. This is sort of like when Roth pulled her alibi, how her memory got really hazy. It's the same thing. Like, I can't figure it out. Meredith's door is locked. Not like she could figure out the whole, if she weren't involved, the whole crime. But her level of non-worry and confusion, like immediately, if you look at Philomena's testimony on the stand, she's like, Immediately, I thought maybe Meredith got hurt. That She definitely thought that was Meredith's blood. And maybe something's wrong. Maybe she, you know, fell and hit her head in the tub, passed out on the bed. I don't know. You would be putting, you would be running scenarios through your head. But here you have no scenarios and just sort of like, you know, well, she does have scenarios. They're just really improbable. Like, I thought that someone hurt themselves. That was, if you listen to my prison intercept episode. That's something her mom offered up because Amanda's world doesn't go much beyond herself. So of course she's like thinking about <laughs> herself, not someone else hurting themselves. She's like, I just thought some girl had a period issue. Who is this some girl? Not Meredith, the neat freak. And what kind of period would you have to leave a huge stain of blood on the bath mat in the shape of a footprint? That would be a pretty unusual. No. <laughs> All right. Back to this story. This is, this is part one of it. Like what, like, first of all, I wasn't able to like try to understand how all of those things fit together. Mm -hmm. And that was even like more disconcerting because it's like, I do not know how to make sense of this. This is not something that is very clear to me. I don't even know if Meredith is here, but it's weird to me that her door is locked. She is no <laughs> Holmes, Sherlock Holmes. She can't figure this. This this is a riddle too great for Amanda Knox to figure out. She just can't make sense of it. And that was very disconcerting, her confusion. I mean, this is the, I mean, if you've lived a little bit in life, it, this is really hard to believe, no? And so I asked Raphael to try to kick it in. Indeed, I even tried to like see if I could see into her window through the terrace, but of course I couldn't see anything. And um, he tried to kick it in, but you know, especially when you don't know what's going on, like you're not quite sure. You're like tentative, and like he tried. Oh, so he was too tentative. He wasn't sure what was going on, so he tried, but not really tried, to knock in the door. Right? Somehow, Philomena's boyfriend could knock it knock down the door right away, but, and, but not, and the police, but not, uh, but, uh, not rough. I tried twice and it didn't work. Um, and so finally we, he just called his sister who is a police officer. She recommended calling the police. We called the police. We left the house cause I, I was nervous. Like I just didn't know what to think. And I how many times has she told us she was confused or she didn't know what to think? Seems like an awful lot, no? I was just confused. It's almost like her refrain, like, I just can't remember what I did that night. Was I with Raph? But Raph says I wasn't with him. He's pulled this alibi. I don't know. Was it Patrick Lumumba? But when she accused Patrick Lumumba, she started shaking, putting her hands on her head and saying, it's him, it's him. Like she was really afraid of him. And people who saw that thought, oh my gosh, they really believed her. She's very, she's 
was called in prison, the actress, and she can she can sell these stories to people. Assume there was a break in. Apparently, the person only went through Philomena's room, but why and if there was in her room her camera, like, sitting right there, like, her laptop sitting right there, like, what? Yeah, just kind of like how your lamp was sitting right in Meredith Kircher's room. It was your only light source. You lived in a really dark room. You weren't friends. What was your lamp doing in her room? On the floor, no less. Almost like you were looking for something under the bed like maybe a ripped out earring, perhaps. There was also blood stains under the bed. What did they take? I didn't see anything taken. Um, so I just did not know what to make sense of it. Okay, so she didn't see anything taken, so she, that's how she knew definitively, she and Raph, that nothing was taken. Great. Excellent. Excellent, Amanda. And... Um, all I knew is it creeped me out. And so I I went outside with Raphael and thank goodness Raphael was there because I wouldn't even know who to call. Like I, I just didn't, it's not 911 in Italy. Um, it's 113, I think. Yesterday, she didn't call the police when she was alone in the apartment or the, the cottage because she said she didn't know the number. Now she's with Raph, and now, thank heavens, Raph is there because he knows the emergency number. Wouldn't that be something that you learned right away? And don't your cell phones automatically have the emergency contact on the front? Is that a new thing? Wasn't Didn't that exist in 2007, or, am I, or is that a new thing? Let me know. It just seems so implausible. Thank heavens Raph was there because I don't know what 911 is in Italy. Even though I've lived in, even though I visited Germany, have family in Germany, and it's the same code, but okay. Um, or 112. Either way, like I didn't know. <laughs> um, and, and a couple of minutes after we are outside of the house, these two, well, there's one that comes up and then shortly afterward there's another cop that comes up and they're not in uniform they're wearing regular clothes and they say that they're there to look for philomena mm -hmm. and i thought philomena um okay what what's wrong with philomena and they, sh they were like oh no we have philomena's phone um and, and this is really interesting the postal police officer asked for philomena's number and she gave meredith's english phone number so the number that probably, you know, the number she called, the number she used to call phone home. So many people think that's one of the reasons why she was trying to delay the finding of Meredith's body. And we have these two phones and one of them belongs to Philomena. And so I thought, okay, well, Philomena is on her way. I had called Philomena and asked her to come home, like her room was ransacked. And um, and then I was like, so are you here for the call that we made? And they said, no. Well, okay, I wasn't saying this. Raphael was saying it for me because that wasn't happening. Okay, so she's pretending she called the police. No, there were, <laughs> no, 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 and no. This is probably around 1230, 1235. They didn't call the police till I think it was like 1257, closer to 1 p.m. So no, the phone records don't support your story, Amanda, but okay. Um, and so we, we brought them into the house to show them that there had been a break-in. Um, and we kept telling them like, it looks like a break-in, but it doesn't look like anything has been stolen. And so we don't know what to make of it. And they kept saying, well, it's not our jurisdiction. Like, well, you called the police, so they'll come. And um, so we waited for them. And then, um, but what ended up happening first was Philomena arrived. Um, she had with her, her boyfriend um, and two friends who were a couple at the time. 
And as soon as Philomena arrived, the pressure was kind of off of me because she could, she was, you know, one of the people of the house who actually could speak Italian. Mm -hmm. And so she immediately started in with the police officers, just blah, 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 and like freaking out and going through a room. And, um, and so Philomena wasn't, wasn't confused, didn't know how she felt, felt that she didn't know how she felt, was disconcerting. She was really freaked out right away and wanted the involvement with the postal police immediately. Interesting. And then eventually um, what ended up happening was focus was brought onto Meredith's room again. And especially when we identified the phones that the, the police had brought um, as Meredith's. Mm -hmm. And so they, we, like Philomena was saying, we have, to, we have to kick down the door. And I was like, well, we tried to kick down the door. Um, and, and then so, they tried again, and this time it was um, Philomena's boyfriend and his friend who kicked down the door, and that's when they discovered Meredith's body. Um, there was, uh, I mean, Philomena immediately started screaming, just screaming. Um, I did not see into the room. Mm -hmm. um, I was away, so I didn't really... Wait, so guys, just... Take a note of that. She did not see into the room. Okay? Just remember that. Really, all I heard from her was blood and a foot. So she kept saying the words for blood and foot um, and screaming and was hysterical. And immediately the police, like, pushed us out of the, out of the, I mean, Raphael grabbed me and, like, shut so just a correction, Raf didn't, I'm looking at my notes, Raf didn't call the police till 1251, okay? Right after he called his sister, Vanessa, he called the police, the real police, the Carbonara. This is the Carbonara. This is the, um, I think we're, are we still at the, I think, yeah, I think we're still with the plainclothes policeman here. Pulled me out, but we were told we have to leave now. Mm -hmm. um, and... And I remember slumping down by the front door, just outside of the front door, trying to make sense of what was being said. So I knew there was blood, mm -hmm. and I knew there was a foot. And I thought that they were suggesting that there was a dismembered foot mm -hmm. in the room. Um, and you know, that would cause someone to be hysterical. <laughs> um, I did not know what to make of that. Um, she didn't know what to make? How about being horrified? How about horrified at the idea of a severed foot in, in your good friend Meredith's bedroom? But apparently she just, she still just, is reserving judgment. She's kind of, you know, Amanda Knox is fair that way. She reserves judgment. Or maybe she's just too confused. It's just such an interesting, but we know that she, such an interesting interview. We know that at 1247, right after the door was knocked down, she called her mother. So this is a call that Amanda says she doesn't remember but it lasted 88 seconds and her mother told her to call the police. So what I did was the, the most automatic thing was to call my mom. Um, I actually had called her once before already when I was on my way back to Raphael's the first time because I was just like, I don't know what to make of this. I don't know if I should be worried or not. Mm -hmm. um, so I asked her advice and she said to ask Raphael. Um, and this time I just told her like, mom, I don't know what's going on. They say that there's a foot in Meredith's room. And like, she was like, what are you talking about? Like just as shocked as I was. And I was like, look, I don't know what's happening. Like, give me a second. I need to talk to Raphael. He needs to talk to the other people. Like I need to figure out what's going on. And so that just outside of the house that morning was just incredibly confusing, um, trying to gather information, sitting there shocked, like, you, you never expect to come home to that. And I, I never 
thought that that was like even the wor like the worst possibility of what was happening. Um, I, I really relied on Raphael to ask questions for me. Um, and he relayed back various information that it was Meredith, that her body was wrapped up in a blanket and stuffed in a cupboard. So now, so now, so now apparently Raph knows everything. And this is, so what she's doing is she's creating a story for the reason why she told Meredith's friends that how she knew before anyone else that Meredith had died a slow, painful death, that how she was positioned in the room, where she died, that she was close, you know, closer to the wardrobe, all those things. Now, in other interviews, she said that the police made a motion, but that's sort of the new version. I think that's the version that she's telling nowadays that the police made a motion and she knew everything that it was very bloody that Meredith was stabbed when they called Meredith's English friends, their testimony was that the police just said that Meredith had an accident. They didn't say that she was dead. Nothing. I mean, they were very tight lipped and I don't see why. Uh, and according to her, why Raph would know any of this. And according to her letter home, Raph was busy getting her and keeping her from running into the room and seeing for herself. He was being a gentleman and keeping her from the room. But now, now he just is like Mr. Reporter and former. This is a new Raph. He's going to tell her everything that went on. Keep her informed. Is what I understood from what people were saying. Um, they said that there was blood everywhere. They were talking about her throat being slit. Um, and I, I, I couldn't. Somehow the, everybody was talking about it outside the house, but she was the only one with this knowledge. And somehow she knew she was the only one with this knowledge when she told one of Meredith's friends, what do you want to know? I know, I, I found her first. I know everything. If you guys remember back to the dolls, one of the dolls says that. Amazing Amanda Knox. It's amazing dolls speak Amanda Knox's own words. I think that's what that episode is called. Picture it. It just seemed so strange because it's like one thing to see a scene like that on CSI or whatever, um, and it's another one to imagine someone you actually know, like some living person who you just talked to yesterday in those conditions. Um, and so I was really struggling with it. I, I was very scared. She's not just horrified and sad. What is, what are all these adjectives? I'm struggling. I don't know how I feel. How about horrified and sad and shocked? and terror and and traumatized how about those adjectives those would come out of my mouth pretty quickly but she's crafting you, you she's crafting the story scared um and i was very confused um and i wait 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 for the guy i'm not sure we all got that wait is amanda knox confused i'm not sure she might have mentioned it once before, but I, I'm not certain if I really understood that she's confused. Okay. Okay. You're confused, Amanda. Confusion. She's confused and her memory's hazy. And wow, what a way to avoid responsibility, huh? Having to get, it's really like Adnan, Syed. I don't remember. Remember how Amanda Knox started this? It was just Everything looked very ordinary except for the blood and the open door. It was just an ordinary day. Nothing extraordinary happened that day except my ex-girlfriend went missing and the police called me that day. Oh, 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 okay. 
Yeah, this is when you don't want to get pinned down. But she did pin herself down to an to an alibi, and Raph was still to this day says there is time that Amanda wasn't with him. Now, do I believe that? No, but he pulled his alibi. To, had a press conference and everything around the time of this interview and was saying that she that Amanda may have gone out alone. They like had these waves of emotions. Like I would all of a sudden be overcome with like crying and, and feeling sad. And then I would be like really spaced out and just looking around watching people cry or or stand there despondently and then of course like the police i remember just like being super out of it when um outside of the outside of the house when that was going on i was cold see isn't it funny that everyone else felt that you were acting strangely almost every single person felt that you were off the spectrum of a normal human reaction so of course on one side of the spectrum, there's crying and wailing and screaming and dropping to your knees and cursing God. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's stoic, numb, strong, poker face type behavior, shock type behavior. But every one of Meredith's friends and, it, and including and the police and everyone who was around you at the time felt that your behavior was particularly strange that it that they never saw any tears which isn't particularly strange in itself but that you were at the police station sitting on your on Raf's lap sticking your tongue out doing cartwheels handstands saying insensitive things, being very annoyed that you were, and I can understand being annoyed if you're being asked, but but being asked to talk to the police for hours on end, I can imagine that being annoying. But everyone did it in in with a good attitude, except for you, Amanda. And because your story couldn't be supported, say like when you said you stayed in with raf the computer in which you played amelie tur just had no interaction past six o'clock so amelie went off at nine ten, sort of by itself meaning you guys might have put on amelie hoping to get an alibi from it and let it roll saying, oh, we were home watching Amelie. But that didn't really work out because there was no human interaction with the computer. And you had turned off your phones at the same time that night and turned them on, meaning the night of November 1st, the night of Meredith's murder, and turned them on very early together the next morning, the only time you did that. So your behavior rang everybody's alarm bells. Amanda. Old um, Raphael gave me his his jacket, and police came and asked questions and more questions, and um, and I was just trying to put the information together. I remember being very focused on trying to piece together every single bit of information that I had gathered that morning. So, like blood in the bathroom, and there was feces in the toilet, but then. She still has to put it together. She's still putting it together. She still can't figure out exactly what went on, but she's telling everyone around her, I know everything. I know what happened. What do you want to know? <laughs> so this is such a fiction. And when I came home the second time, it seemed like the feces wasn't there. Um, and, and that's something that struck me. Like I remember thinking, oh my God, I have to tell the police. And I... I went up to them actually like they had by then were done talking to me and we're all standing out there and I remember it was Monica Napoleoni who is um, the head of homicide but I didn't know who she was at a time all she was is this skinny woman with long lank black hair um, who I went up to her and I was like look like one of the first time I came here there was feces in the toilet and now there's not and she like glared at me like 
like, and I was like, why? <laughs> like, just go. Yeah, because everybody thought it was very strange that you were very involved with that and presented it like a prize to the police and weren't at all concerned with what happened to your friend. It was all about that toilet. And that's why people were giving you that look, Amanda. Oh, look, you can you can see for yourself. And she came back um, and she was like, I'm gonna remember, like, I'm gonna remember, and there's feces in this toilet, what are you talking about? And I was just like, oh, well, I thought that there wasn't, sorry. And then I just kind of backed away and was quiet again. Um, but she seemed really angry at me for that. Um, and I was really confused. Um, like I was trying, like I was almost making fun or something. Like I was trying to get in her way or something. But I had gone up to her like legitimately. Like I, th I saw that there wasn't shit in the toilet when I came back the mm -hmm. second time. And what ended up happening was it had slid down from in the bowl. And so I didn't see it. But anyway, it was um, it was just really confusing, um, and it was a lot of just. Okay, here's a question for you: What's the ratio of what would you say the time she's mentioned Meredith to the time she's mentioned the feces in the toilet? I would say. <laughs> It's about a one to 20 ratio, maybe one to five, maybe more realistic. I mean, one to 20, I'm just fooling around. What, like one to five ratio that she's mentioned Meredith compared to how many times she's mentioned this toilet and what's in it? What do you guys think? Standing there. Um, I mean, Philomena was, was hysterical. Laura wasn't there. Um, it was only... Philomena and her friends and me and Raphael and Philomena like I said was hysterical and so her and her boyfriend and her friends were comforting her and then Raphael was comforting me um, and like I said just waves of like really high emotion and then feeling just completely overwhelmed by the greatness that's interesting I would never call grief a uh high emotion, but maybe she means high by intense, but okay. This is interesting what she says here. Listen to this. ...of it that was inconceivable, not wanting to think, like hoping that what they, like the person who was in the room wasn't actually Meredith. Um, I get, I was... The greatness of Meredith's murder was inconceivable. So I'm putting in Meredith's murder that, but what she said is the greatness of it was inconceivable. So I assume she is asking us to think of greatness as enormity, intensity, but greatness to me was like, I don't know, the greatness of it. What a odd, again, very odd word to use, but she's crafting, she's crafting a story. It was just, everything was too big, too much to understand. And she was acting normally. Everybody was being comforted. She was just comforting Raph with the cartwheels and the splits and the sticking her tongue out and sitting on his lap. I, I'm surprised she didn't say Philomena was sitting on her boyfriend's lap and sticking her tongue out. But I guess that would be a bridge too far for Amanda. Really, really thinking that because when I heard that they said that it was a body wrapped in a blanket, I thought, well, then how do they know it's her? Like, how do they know? Um, but then at the same time, like they said that her throat had been slit. And so, of course, they would have seen. And so I just didn't know what to make sense of it. Um, and then we went to the police office. And the, the few days that I had left, I was in the police office. Um, the few days that you had left? What do you mean the few days that you had left? What is she terminally ill? Before November 1st, maybe you could say Meredith Kircher, like uh, the end of October had the few days she had left. But you had your whole life ahead of you, Amanda Knox. What are you talking about? The few days you had left? The few days that I had left on the outside before I got into the prison with the great food and being treated really well. And hanging out with these people who are organizing me go back to the go back to her description 
of prison life with the intercept episode I did Amanda Knox prison intercept her telling her mom about the prison conditions, but she sounded like she was in her element in prison. And, you know, it, it, European prisons sound infinitely nicer than American prisons. You can wear your own clothes. They have nurseries. She's talked about going to the nursery for mothers who give birth in prison so they can be near their children. And she was very close with the clergyman, the prison clergyman, who apparently, according to her, cried for her because he felt so bad because immediately upon laying eyes on her, he knew she didn't belong there and she was innocent. I mean, give me a break, but okay. They took me back to the house twice, um, once to go into the downstairs apartment because there was blood there, um, which was really freaky. Um, they asked me to look at the bed that was splattered with blood, and they asked me if anything looked strange. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? You mean besides the, the blood on the bed? Like, what are you talking about? And they're like, no, is this, is this not normal? And I was like, well, of course it's not normal. Like, what are you talking about? Um, and Wait, so now this blood is not normal, but the blood in the bathroom was normal. So the blood on the bed is not normal. Of course, what are you thinking? Why aren't you more upset, police officers? Why could you even ask me a question about it being normal? But the open door and the blood all around the apartment, that's totally A-OK -okay normal. All right, gotcha, gotcha, Amanda. Wow, this is some acted out story, huh? And I remember like tiptoeing around there. Um, and then the following day, they brought me back again. And by this time, like there was press just lurking everywhere. I mean, there was press lurking everywhere from the beginning. But like they were really, the police were very aware of their presence. And so like when I was in the back of their police car, like they had me lay down in the back seat with like a, with a jacket on top of me. Um, and I bet she loved that. Amanda Knox was talking to her Aunt Dolly in Germany, and she's like, what paper am I in? And, and she said, uh, she said, this is from an intercept. She says, her Aunt Dolly says, wait, no, I think I'm reading from the transcripts. Okay, so her aunt, this is a prison intercept uh, from November 5th. Her Aunt Dolly says, wait, no, I think I... I'm too dumb for computers, you know. Her mom's, her aunt Dolly's trying to find the article, and then she goes on to says, to say, then you're glad your mom's coming tomorrow, Amanda. Yes, I'm really super excited. Dolly says, I know, Amanda. I know I will be able to cheer, I will be able to cheer me up and trying to help put my life back together because it is God. Dolly, is the this is London. Amanda Knox, what is it? Dolly, this is London. Amanda, this is London? On, and then she gives her the website, shows up, and you're, and she's, and her Aunt Dolly saying, says, shows up, you know, the wall with their blood, and then a picture of Meredith with somebody, and then the next image by scrolling down is you talking to a cop with a beard. And then maybe a COP. Amanda Knox says, uh-huh, Dolly. And there's one that has kind of curly hair and sunglasses over his head and looks like you're wearing a blue sweater and a T-shirt. Amanda, yes. Seems to be made at home, huh? Amanda, yes. And light pants, what? Type white pants or something? Amanda, yes, I was wearing a white shirt. Dolly says, oh, then it's white. They have a whole conversation about her in the press. And she's so excited to be in the press. And uh, finally, just skipping through, uh, her Aunt Dolly's reading her the headline, sort of saying, no, it just says, a friend, Amanda Knox, answers questions of an investigator close to the home she shared with Meredith in Perugia. And Amanda Knox says, yes, okay. And Amanda says, people were stationed outside my home. So when I came back, that is... 
the police continue br to bring me back to the house to look at something and make me, this was different. What is this? Blah, blah, blah. So gone is, I was so much help. I'm just trying to help the police. Now it's blah, blah, blah. They're asking me again and again. It's be, meaning an annoyed attitude towards the police emerges in those intercepts. Very different from the, I was just trying to help the police out and they weren't appreciating all my help. I wanted to figure it out just as much as they did. Then, but then I was brought out into the open and brought into the house. So I don't really understand why they did that. Um, and that the second time they brought me to the house was when they actually brought me back into the apartment. Um, and they wanted me to like tell them, describe to them about everything that I had seen when I got back there. But then the thing that they really wanted me to do um, was to go through the knife drawers. And that, it really hit me. Bro Jogan, thank you for the $2 super sticker. Appreciate it. So this is very interesting. Amanda Knox is about to describe. So when she was shown the knives in her own apartment, I thought originally I may have said in another episode it was Raph's apartment, but it definitely is in her apartment. She's shown the knives and she, but the important thing in this story is that she puts her fists up to her head and starts hitting her head, like hitting herself in the head. Do you know, have you ever had like a younger breath, like a younger or older brother go like, why are you hitting yourself? Like taking your own hand, like she's hitting herself very hard. Maybe David, David Byrne talking head, same as it ever was <laughs> like just hitting her head, like with her fists and freaking out. And she did the same thing in the police station when they asked to take her fingerprints when she knew she had to give over her fingerprints, same, same motion to her head, like hitting her head and getting like, like she's angry with herself. Here, this is Amanda Knox's own description. At that moment, um, I, um, cause they were asking me if, if I, if I could recognize that the murder weapon was missing. Um, and that freaked me out. Um, I think it was one of the first times that I really, really realized that, that, like, the extent to what had happened. Um, because, like, they had asked me weird questions about, like, her sex habits, and so... She loves to bring that up. She loves to humiliate Meredith and tell you exactly what those sex questions were and what the answer was. Melissa B., thank you very much for the Canadian 199 super sticker. But what a performance. You know, she's really worried. She was really disturbed by the questions, the questions they were asking. Well, like, of course, there was like going through my mind, like what happened to her? And like, especially with the blood splatters downstairs, I thought was like she chased from downstairs, like up into the house, like, um, but, but it was when they asked me about knives that I flipped out. Um, I, I, I could not hold in um, the, the, the tension, the fear, the, the, the just like devastating sadness. And so I, I just, I was uncontrollable crying and they actually had to like set me down on the couch and like they brought over their interpreter. And yeah, no, that's not the police's version of it, but okay. Interesting. The police describe it the same way I just described it. Hitting her head, hitting herself over the head. Melissa V, thank you again for the three dot, this time for the 
$3 Canadian super sticker. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Okay. And like tried to, God, it... I mean, I should have realized that they suspected me already then. All right. That is the end of that. So what do you guys think? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know what to think of that. But it's just interesting. I was trying to think today. Is there any reason why Raph and Amanda would change their story so much? Besides being involved. Is there a, another good reason why you would tell, say, the police you were home that night together and then all of a sudden say, oh, no, you put yourself like Amanda Knox did once Raph pulled her alibi. She said, oh, no, I was at the scene. I was at the kitchen table. I put my hands over my ears. She knew somehow that Meredith Kircher made a blood curdling scream that other people heard. Is there any reason why they would do that? Change up their story like that? I mean, this is the most important I would think a most important interview of your life as far as consequences, wouldn't you be, wouldn't you be sure to get everything right and say it with certainty? Okay. Thank you, big lady for the five pounds. I'm convinced by that story. Totally innocent. Okay. Really? <laughs> is that sarcasm or is that? Just the story alone, that's all you need? Is that story? Knowing nothing else? Okay. Appreciate the five pounds and appreciate you listening. So it's just, I was thinking, is there any reason why you would falsely accuse your boss, the boss that was nice to you? Nice until a point because she was working as a waitress. So Patrick Lumumba had this bar called Le Chic. And originally she was hired as a waitress, but she wasn't really interested in doing any waitressing or bartending. She was mostly interested in flirting with the male customers, which is not unusual for a right for a 20 year old, but she was like a crap worker. So Patrick Lumumba, at the time of Meredith Kircher's murder, he had demoted her to handing out flyers. So I can imagine her being pretty PO'd by that. And Meredith was supposed to take over her shifts. She had worked already as a bartender. And of course she was working. She didn't have a visa. So I'm sure she was working under the table. And Amanda Knox is, doesn't struggle with ego. I'm sure that handing out flyers was not going from being a bartender. It is kind of it club to handing out flyers was not so great for her. But why would you, why would you, even if, if you were uncertain, even that, that your boss killed your roommate, why would you say it with such certainty and then let him sit in prison or jail prison, actually prison for two weeks and do nothing. She never recanted. To the police, she never said, no, no. Patrick Lumumba got out on his own alibi. So what, I just would love to hear some other reasonings for that. Because I can't think of any other reason besides being involved. I mean, I understand why, say, someone like Jay Wilds changed his theory. I mean, story not theory, story. It's because he wanted to protect his grandmother, but she doesn't have any relatives in Italy. There's no one for her to protect. Why change your story? So odd. But, you know, 
It's interesting on the Joe Rogan interview, she says that she's so, she feels so badly for the other quote, wrongfully convicted people, unquote, that don't have media training. So my question is, how much media training has she had? And what do they tell her to say? Because she seems to have the tropes, like these wrongful conviction cliches down pat. Like, oh, they came in with an idea about me. Yeah, they came in and they wanted to frame the American and her boyfriend, knowing nothing else. They came in with an idea about you. Right, Amanda? I mean, you can see the testimony of the officers in the police station. They're buying her snacks. They're worried. They're telling her to go home. They're telling. They're worried about her health. How are you feeling? You look pale. So it just doesn't seem to follow her story that they were all out to get her. They had tunnel vision investigation. Sloppy. Everything was corrupted. All, all the forensic evidence got corrupted except for Rudy Gudez. Just none of this follows any kind of logic at all. But that's what the propaganda does, is it, is it blows small things up and makes them really big so you lose all perspective of the entire case. And that Supreme Court what they knew for sure was that this was a crime with multiple attackers. The break-in room was staged. And that is really significant because if this was not a real break-in, the only people with an incentive to stage a break-in were was Amanda and by extension Rap, if he was there to make it look like they weren't in the home, that they didn't let in Rudy Goudet. And I will eventually, I'm working up to an episode where I go through the entire scene and tell you what I think happened. But I want to go through, you know, just really hone in on these inconsistencies and what they mean. Because I don't think, so when I say that, say the glass, one of the reasons they knew that the break-in room was staged is because the glass was on top of things. It's because the significance of that is that it means that the room was rifled through before the window was broken. And Philomena said her shutters were closed. How did Rudy Gooday, if he really scaled that wall like Spider-Man, how did he not disturb any of the grass on the ground next to the wall building, climbing up it? How did he, it was muddy that, the ground was muddy. How did he not leave any muddy footprints on the side of the building? And how did he physically climb up it without cutting himself? There is no DNA of Rudy Gooday anywhere in Philomena's room. But what we do know about Philomena's room is there is the mixed DNA of Meredith and Amanda that lights up under luminol, meaning they were bleeding at the same time. Why was Amanda and Meredith bleeding at the same time? I mean, many people speculated that that scratch was from Meredith, who was a brown belt in karate, very close to a black belt, kicking. So we know she was restrained from the lack of physical wounds, kicking Amanda Knox, maybe in her neck. I mean, that's right in self-defense. That's like right where they tell you to go, right? The middle of the body, right? So maybe she got kicked in the nose, it's just hard to know. It's just hard to imagine. She did have six earrings in one ear, four in the other. It's hard to imagine her ears bleeding in the amount. I mean, there's just a big glob of her blood on the tap in the sink. And then, of course, there's the her DNA mixed with, you know, Meredith's DNA in multiple places in the 
bathroom. So I think that's what I have for tonight. Have a good, have a good weekend, everybody. And I will see you back next time. Good night.